All right. Well, welcome to Friendship Baptist Church. My name is Jason. I'm the pastor here, and we just want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's going to be, a, I'm excited about what we're going to get to dig into in the teaching time, but we're also going to get to dig in through prayer and through worship and songs. And so as we get started, I want to let you know a couple things before we dive in. And the uh, first thing is this Connect card that you see in the seat in front of you. Uh, we just ask members and guests alike to fill out as much as you're comfortable with. And if you do that, there's a, for instance, there's a place for prayer requests. Even if you just have a prayer request you want to fill out uh, with no name, that's fine. We just want to take these and pray for you. But here's the reason I bring it up at the beginning every time. Don't put it in the offering plate when that goes around in a little bit. Uh, that, if you're a guest, please don't feel obligated to participate in that. It's our way of giving as an act of worship uh, through the offering time. But this, at the end, during the big announcements, you might want to sign up for something or get more information. So if you do fill it out, just leave it in your seat and we'll pick it up at the end of the gathering, okay? So I just want to let you know that as we get started. Uh, I'm just going to pray for us, and we'll get after it, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, for a new year, and for uh, just fresh starts. I pray uh, right now for those that already feel like it's not been a fresh start, they're already tired for the year, God. I pray that your presence would be in this space, that we would be encouraged, we would be strengthened, and that we would be changed by your presence. We love you, and we thank you. And we ask it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to worship. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jason. So glad y'all are here. Thank y'all for joining us this morning. Um, we are excited to worship together, and, and we encourage you to do that. It may look different uh, for each of us. Um, some of you may want to stand and sing at the top of your lungs. Some may want to sit and, and, and have time with just meditation and, and thought. Uh, and we, we understand that. So we, we just encourage you to worship however the Lord would have you this morning. Um, this first song is called Good Plans. Um, we sang it last week, but as we start the new year, it's uh, something that I, I just want to sing over our congregation, sing over myself. Uh, I believe that God has good plans. Maybe uh, 2023 was a rough one for you, but I want you to know that God has good plans for you uh, in 2024. And, and maybe it's not you singing it for yourself. Maybe it's you singing it over someone else and, and singing and encouraging them this morning. So I'm just going to encourage you this morning. Let's stand and worship and, and praise the Lord. Uh, he has good plans uh, for us. Thank you. 
has good plans. Sing this out this morning.
Church, we're going to sing this out this morning. I see joy rising. I hear hope come. Let's worship this morning. I see joy rising. I hear hope calling. I see fear hiding. I hear chains falling. I see walls shaking. I hear doubt running. It's my God's on his way. Yes, he is coming. I see joy rising. I hear hope calling. I see fear hiding. I hear chains falling. I see walls shaking. I hear doubt running. It's my God's on his way. Yes, he is coming. pray that you are praised this morning in your house, Lord, that we lift up our voices and we lift up our praise to you and you alone, God. Let it not be about us, God. Let it be about you being here. You are with us, God. We praise you. Lord, I pray that you be with these tithes and offers, Lord, that they be used to grow your kingdom, God, not only here, God, our friendship, but in the community around the world, God. We praise you, God, this morning. As we continue in worship this morning, I just 
wanted to talk a little bit about this next song. Um, this song is How Great Thou Art. It's one that many of us know, many of us know well. But I wanted to talk through uh, the lyrics and, and the way that the song is kind of presented. Um, we see verse 1. Um, it talks about um, consider all the works the hands have made, um, see the stars. Talking about creation and seeing uh, God's creation and, and if you've been doing a Bible plan um, or if you're going through uh, some of the stuff that, that Jason sent out, then, then you've seen um, the creation uh, at the beginning in Genesis. And we talk about how God saw it and it was good. But this is talking about um, God creating and seeing the stars, seeing the mighty thunder, uh, seeing his power throughout the universe. Um, and then it says, then sings my soul. And so this is us declaring, God, you are great, you are powerful, you are mighty. We see your creation. Um, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Um, and some people in place put, how great you are. Um, and then we see verse 2, and verse 2 talks about, um, about Christ coming. Um, and it says, when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. Um, that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. And so this is, this is the writer talking about what Christ came to do. For us, and then we sing because of that. We sing, uh, then sings my soul, my Savior God. So it's a response. So first we see verse one where it's a response of God's creation. Then we see it's our response to God sending Christ. And then we see verse four, and when, this is Christ coming back and us looking forward uh, to that reunion. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration. And there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. And then we sing again. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. And so it's, a, it's almost like an explanation of who God is in creation and, and who Christ is. And then God coming back. And then us uh, celebrating that after each verse. And so I want to encourage you as we sing this morning, um, how great thou art. Um, that you would be mindful of those three things. That God being in creation and being great in, in what he created and seeing God's creation, that God sent his son to die for us so that we didn't have to bear that. Um, and then um, Christ coming back and, and, and us looking forward to that. So as we sing this morning, I just want you to be mindful. Sometimes uh, it's easy to sing a song and just and just sing the words because we know them. But it, uh, it's very important that, that, we, that we think about what we're saying and how we're declaring that. So let's stand again and sing how great thou art this morning.
declare this. My soul. great you are. Pray that we never lose sight of that. We never lose sight of you, God, who you are. Be praised in this place this morning. I pray that you be with Brother Jason as he brings your word, God. Would you come and speak to us through your word, God. Open our hearts and our ears to hear from you this morning.
24 years ago, almost to this exact day, I was sitting in my living room having a conversation in my head with God. See, at the time, I was 23 years old, and Amy and I had been married for two years, and things were going well. I was a senior in computer science, getting ready to graduate, starting to look at job opportunities, and everything seemed to be going great. And all of a sudden, I no longer had a feeling of peace and direction for the next step of life. And so as I dealt with that, that whole day, it was a Thursday, rode around town, tried to find a pastor friend that could help me. Both of them were out of town or weren't available. So I had to just deal with it with God. I realized that God was calling me into full-time ministry. Now, my dad was a pastor. I, had, I didn't want anything to do with that, just so you know. And I was dealing with this, and I was sitting there, and I remember the conversation I had with God that night. Uh, of course, it was in my head. I wasn't saying it out loud, but I was telling him all the reasons this was a bad idea. God, you don't understand. You know, those kind of moments where you try to explain to God uh, how you know more than him. I told him, I'm 23 years old. I'm too young. Who would listen to me? Um, I, I don't have any training. I don't know how to preach. I don't know how to pastor. Even if I did surrender to the ministry, and that's exactly what it's called, you surrender to the ministry. So I was just like, hey, I think this would be a great idea. If I surrender to the ministry, who would even know to even call me to, to like preach and do all these things? And what I remember about that moment was feeling that looking at the task before me, the idea of being a pastor and thinking, this is too big of a task for me, I felt completely inadequate. Maybe you're here today and there's some tasks in front of you where you feel like you're not up for that task. You feel inadequate as well. Maybe it's raising kids and doubts creep in and you're saying to yourself, I don't even know how to do this. I don't even know where to, I mean, I don't even know if they're going to turn out all right or not. I really don't know. Maybe it's a relationship or your marriage and you're looking at it going, I don't know how to make this work. I'm not sure even what the next step would be. Well, those feelings of not being up to the task, feeling inadequate, the good news is you're not alone. We've all stood at the crossroads of doubt, not sure how to step forward because of that feeling of inadequacy. And today we're going to be looking at a story from the book of Joshua. We're actually kicking off a series where we're going to study in the book of Joshua where God calls Joshua to take his people into the promised land. And there's much of that story that we can identify because when you think about what God was calling him to do, the very first thing God tells him to do three times in just a couple of verses is be strong and courageous. By the way, be strong and courageous. Oh, one more time, be strong and courageous. And the reason for that is because Joshua probably felt the same way. I mean, all of a sudden, he's going to take the people into the promised land. They've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years at this point. Moses took the people out of slavery in Egypt. Now, because of disobedience, they ended up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, so that whole generation dies out. Now, it's Joshua's job to take them in. So he's got to be a military leader, because the problem with the promised land is it's inhabited. Okay, It's not like they just go and move in to these empty homes. Uh, If somebody came in your house today and said, hey, this is my house now, there'd probably be problems, right? Some, I know a lot of you carry, so there'd be a lot of big problems as a result of that. Uh, it's not going to be easy. There's going to be a fight going on with that. He's got to understand that he's taking people that have never been in homes. They lived in tents. This is the generation that grew up in the wilderness. They don't know how to set up a farm or how to build a house or create, you know, take care of the walls even in a city. God was calling him to all of that. And so he tells him to be strong and courageous. Maybe that's where you feel today. You feel some adversity. Maybe you feel some resistance about moving forward. I want you to know there's some good truth about that. And here's this. When you're talking about being strong and courageous, you can't gain strength without resistance. And you can't find courage without adversity. And so instead of trying to avoid it at all costs, what if we see what God's doing in the midst of that? Because there's battles in Joshua. Joshua in the Battle of Jericho and places like that. We can get so caught up in the battles that we miss what God is doing in the midst of the battles. And some of you might be in a battle, and we're so focused on the battle, we miss out what God's trying to do. And through that, I pray that you'd be strengthened and encouraged. Because Joshua is my favorite book in the Old Testament, okay? Uh, I just just love everything about it. There's battles, there's leadership, there's all kinds of, of, of ways to apply this in our life. But also, it has my favorite character or person from the Old Testament. Now, I have to qualify that. Jesus is my favorite person in the Old Testament. Jesus is my favorite person in the New Testament. Besides him, this has my favorite person in the Old Testament. So obviously I'm talking about Caleb. 
Not Joshua. He makes my top three, okay? But I love the story of Caleb, and he's found in the book of Joshua, and there's so much that we can see from his life as well. But out of this, I took an entire semester and studied just the book of Joshua in one of my seminary classes, just digging it apart. I had to do um, a 10-page paper on uh, pottery in the ancient Middle East for this seafaring peoples, which we think were the Philistines. And I was like, Mycenaean pottery, what does this have to do with Joshua? Okay, like that's how in-depth it was. I can still pick out Mycenaean pottery. The thing I noticed about it was you have Mycenaean pottery. The Philistines had advanced technology, uh, think warfare. And uh, when you look, dig up uh, uh, sites in the Holy Land for uh, the people of Israel, it's just usually mud bowls. There's no poetry. There's no pictures to it. It's very plain. They were not technologically advanced. How did this group take the promised land. And so that's what we see in the book of Joshua. Joshua, is the, the big picture is that God keeps his promises, okay? And so everything else goes under that. But today we're going to see this idea of being strong and courageous. And so I invite you to turn there in Joshua chapter 1. Because when you look at this, what you see is not just the people going into the promised land. You see God taking the people. God using Joshua to go into the promised land. And when I look in this room, I see that, and I believe God wants to do amazing things through your life. I don't believe it's an accident for any person being here today. I have prayed about this. I'm so excited to jump into this because I believe God wants to do amazing things in your marriage. He wants to do amazing things in your family life, your kids' life, at work, in this church. I can't wait to see what God's going to do through us. That's the key. Because we try to do it in our own power. We fail every time. And we maybe you're running on empty already at the beginning of the year. Uh, half of us kicked off the year with flu. <laughs> and so you're just trying to recover can it, is this really the first Sunday of the, uh, of the year? You know, that kind of, it feels like it's been a month. But out of that, we're going to see God work in Joshua's life. So we're going to read a couple of verses in uh, chapter 1 and unpack a few other places. But I just want to share with you what we see God doing in Joshua's life and how we can apply it in our life as well and find some encouragement. Verse 1, it says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. That's his title. Notice that. It starts with titles. Moses, the servant of the Lord, said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. That's his title. He's Moses' assistant. Moses, the servant of the Lord. It's mentioned 13 times that Moses was a servant of the Lord in this book. 18 times throughout the Old Testament. We know Moses was a servant of the Lord. That's who uh, Joshua has to follow because in verse 2, God says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all the people into the land that I'm giving to them to the people of Israel. And he says, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you just as I promised to Moses. So God calls Joshua, Moses' assistant, to lead the people. And so we want to start with uh, how this book lays out. We'll unpack more of the book of Joshua in the, in the study. This is written somewhere around a thousand years before the time of Jesus. Um, we, we, we begin to see a little bit about what's going on here, but Moses... And his death is the start of Joshua. The end of Joshua ends with Joshua's death. So it starts with Moses' death. It ends with Joshua's death. These are the bookends. And we see the title of Moses. He's the servant of the Lord. This is the guy that saw the burning bush, talked to God. Hey, I want you to take my people out of slavery in Egypt. Who shall I say send me? Tell them I am or Yahweh has sent you. So he goes and he takes the people out of Egypt. They cross over the Red Sea. They end up, he gets the law down from Mount Sinai. He, uh, because of disobedience in the people, they wander for 40 years. He shepherds them for those 40 years. And because of disobedience in his life, he's going to miss the promised land. But this is the only leader these people have ever known. They grew up with Moses. And now there's going to be somebody new. Can you imagine? I wonder what kind of leader Joshua will be. You know, probably some anxious being fearful, we, you know, you're just the unknown. How many times do we get afraid because of the unknown? We don't know what the next step is. We don't know what God is going to do next. And so we begin to be afraid. And I'm sure that Joshua is one of those people that had some questions. But Joshua is not just some guy that's just Moses' assistant. You know, some people uh, play that name as belittling to him. No, he was Moses' right-hand man. He, uh, he was a leader. And we actually, we find him several times in the Bible, and this is not the only time. For instance, when you go back to the book of Numbers, and I'll put it on the screen, he was one of the 12 spies that spied out Canaan 40 years before this. So in uh, Numbers chapter 13, it says this, 
the Lord said, spoke to Moses saying, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the people of Israel. Notice he keeps saying, I'm giving this. I'm going to keep my promise. He says, from each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, every one a chief among them. So a chief amongst each tribe. So it's not just anybody. There are chiefs that's going to go in as spies. Now we jump ahead to verse 6 and we see some of the people from the tribes. Uh, verse 6, from the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. There's my favorite character uh, in this book. And then from the tribe of Issachar, Egal, the son of Joseph. And look at verse 8. The, from the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, the son of Nun, from the tribe of Benjamin. Well, we just read about Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. Who is this Hoshea guy? And so you actually have to keep reading. Verse 16 tells us this. These were the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. He changed his name. We talk a lot about how God changes people's names throughout the Bible. What does this have to do with that? I, I get chill bumps when I start to look at these kind of passages because I begin to see a picture of Jesus and what he is doing. So Hoshea literally meant salvation. And then the new name was Yehoshua, which is Yahweh saves. So not just salvation, but now his name means Yahweh saves. And when you look at the name Joshua, uh, that's the English translation of it. In the Old Testament was originally written in the Hebrew language, language of the Old Testament. And so by the time of Jesus, though, most people couldn't read Hebrew. So the rabbis could read Hebrew, the, the Pharisees could read Hebrew, but the everyday person couldn't. The only thing they spoke and read was the common language known as common Greek. And so by the time of Jesus, they had translated the Old Testament into Greek. It's called the Septuagint. And in that, you begin to see Old Testament passages and things start to come to life. Because like right here, when you see the name Joshua or Yehoshua, when you read it in the Septuagint, in the Greek language, it literally reads Iesus. And that may not mean much to you now, but if you read the New Testament and you see this child that was born that was going to be the Messiah, his name is Iesus. His name literally is Jesus. This is Jesus about to take them into the promised land, the place of physical rest. You see, Moses brought them out of physical slavery, and now Iesus, Yahweh saves, is about to take them into the place of rest, the promised land. It's physical, though, um, because then when you begin to realize that Jesus' is, Hebrew name is Yeshua, which is a shortened form of Yehoshua. Joshua and Jesus are the same name. And we get this picture of Jesus taking the people into the promised land. Now, in the book of Hebrews, it tells us by the end of Je Joshua's days, they didn't complete everything. The people were disobedient at times, but they never fully entered into rest. That's where Jesus comes in, the Jesus of the New Testament. And that's when you look at it and you begin to realize in Matthew 11, for instance, Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. You see, Jesus did more than just give us physical rest, although I'm sure some of us could use a nap. He gave us spiritual rest because we were enslaved to sin. And Jesus, when he died on the cross, he paid that perfect price for us. He paid the price so that we could be set free from slavery to sin. And then he says, I want to take you into the promised land. In the, in the Old Testament was the land of rest. And he says, I want to bring you into spiritual rest. That's what Jesus fulfills for us. That's our king and that's who we worship. So we just get to see a picture of it. And it is going to fall short because it's human. But we also get, by the end of this book, we're longing for a Savior. We're longing for that King that would make things right. Everywhere in the Old Testament is looking forward to Jesus. Everything uh, in, in the New Testament is looking back at what Jesus did on the cross and when he rose from the dead. It's all pointing to him. And so out of that, we get this name. Okay, So I don't think it's by accident that he has this name. God is not a, a God of coincidences when it comes to this. Names have meanings all throughout the scriptures. But when you can see that, I didn't know that until I started reading it in seminary and had to read it in Hebrew and read it in Greek and all these things. But it just starts to jump out. God is a God of the details and he keeps his promises and he sees what you're going through. Um, so he tells Moses' assistants that Moses is dead. I want you to take the people into the promised land. And so he, we pick up in verse 4 of Joshua. And I'm just going to read through this. It mentions where they'll take the land, and then he gives him the strong and courageous passages from this. It says, From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. 
just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. I love that. No man will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. But he said, just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Does that sound familiar? That sounds a lot like Jesus in the New Testament. When he gives us the great commission in Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing and teaching them. He says, and lo, I will be with you always, even to the ends of the age. Because when you start looking through scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, the big promise that God gives to us is, says, I will be with you. You will not be alone. When we get to heaven, heaven's reward is not uh, golden streets or a crystal sea or rubies in our crown that we're actually going to lay down at the feet of King Jesus anyway. No, our reward in heaven is that God will be there. We get to enjoy the presence of God. But we don't have to wait to enjoy his presence here on earth. The kingdom of God is among us when we let him rule and reign in our hearts. And so he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Now we get to the passages, 6, 7, and 9 is where he says this, be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Inherit. Sounds pretty easy, right? Okay, someone dies, you inherit a bunch of money or you inherit a dog. I don't know. You get something out of the deal. Doesn't take any work from you. This inheriting is going to take going into the land, taking out the people that are there. And we're not going to bypass that. We're not going to skip over the fact that there's whole cities that get destroyed. Okay, We'll, we'll deal with it. And we'll understand the meaning behind it. But today I just wanted to start with this. He says, you will inherit the lands that I swore to their fathers before them. Verse 7, only be strong and very courageous. He adds the very there, okay? But he's reminding him again to be strong and courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn to it from it to the right hand or to the left that you may have good success wherever you go. He calls him to be strong and courageous. Um, he goes on, uh, verse 8, he, we'll, we'll unpack those together, 7 and 8. He says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it both day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything according to what is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you'll have good success. So how do we define success? In our world today, it's either money or power. Because money buys power, or power uh, trumps money a lot of times. But that's what we define as success in our culture. The Bible never defines success in that way. Never do we find that. What we find success is is seeking God. Jesus put it this way in the New Testament, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you, the, the food and the clothing and the things that you need. He says, seek me first. But so many times in the Old Testament, you see these idols, these false gods, and every one of them promised success through prosperity. Prosperity meant better crops, or better flocks, because that was, that was wealth. And God was giving us a different picture of what success is. And so out of this, he tells us that you'll find success when you don't let the word of God depart from your mouth. Now, this is the sixth book of the Bible we're reading, Joshua. The first five books of the Bible are known as the law. That's what he's talking about. That's all they had at that point. But when you begin to look at what he is calling him to do, he says you shall meditate on it both day and night. Are we spending time in God's word? Not just so God will bless us. You know, that's that prosperity picture. Like, I do these things so God will love me. No, God has loved us so much. He's, he's shown us his love and he's written to us to give us life-giving answers. So we read it from that perspective. And so when you start looking at passages to read, you know, last week we started 24, 24-day 24 devotional, uh, kick off the year 2024. I'm not really cute with names, but I thought that makes sense. 24 days in the year 2024. And last week... Every day was about having a hunger for God's word, finding delight in God's word. Uh, This week is about loving God and loving others. The next week is prayer as we finish out through the 24 days. But the second day, Tuesday, uh, was that of Psalm 1. It says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the seat uh, of the counsel of the wicked, does not stand in the seat of scoffers or in the way of sinners. But it says, it says, His delight is in the law of the Lord. He meditates on it both day and night. And he goes on to say in verse 3, he's like a tree planted by still waters. A tree planted by still waters means it has everything it needs to grow. That's the man who meditates on God's word. Now, when we think about meditation, a lot of times when we talk about meditation, you hear it in our culture, Eastern religion has a, an idea of meditation. That is about the emptying of our minds. That is the idea of humming a phrase or saying something over and over and trying to empty our minds. But biblical meditation is about the filling of our minds. 
with the Word of God, spending time in His Word. And like that tree, that is our source of power. Um, I think back to my first computer. Back in the 90s, I was one of the first people to have a computer, and it was a 486SX with 4 megs of RAM. Most of you don't know what that means, and that's okay. But let's just put it this way. It was really good for the early 90s. It wasn't good enough to play certain video games, I found out. You need a DX processor for that, but I got around it, and I figured those things out. But I could have upgraded and worked on that computer, but you know what? I think back to this phone I have now. You know, that memory in my first computer was four megabytes of RAM. One picture on this phone takes more than four megabytes now. This thing can do amazing things, just like that first computer I thought could do, and there'll be a more amazing things. But the reason I bring it up is this. If I don't plug this in, after a while, it loses power, right? Then it becomes a paperweight, and it is powerless. How many of us are trying to do things in our own power instead of plugging in to where we find life? to where we find the real power source for success. And it's not just money and, and power. It's about knowing God, seeking Him, finding Him. And when you do meditate on His Word, it begins to overflow. When you start spending time on something, it starts to affect your conversations. Like if you've ever binge-watched a show, I'm, maybe I'm the only one, but you decided, I'll just start this new show that came out at 9 o'clock at night. And they've now released all eight episodes, and you look up, and you realize you've watched all eight episodes in a row. I remember I, my friends were in New Orleans, and we were all, we, he was like the local blockbuster for us. That was a video store for some of you. And uh, you would actually go and buy stuff and rent stuff. But he had all the movies, and uh, Amy went home for, uh, it was Mardi Gras week, so that was a major holiday. I had to work. So I stayed, he left, and I had a full king cake that Amy gave me from the teachers. The, she was a teacher, and they gave her the gift of a king cake, and he had Band of Brothers on DVD. And I sat down, and I watched the entire show. I think it was 10 episodes of Band of Brothers and ate that entire king cake in one night. That was a mistake, okay? I did get to sleep off the other, but that king cake is still with me to this day, I'm pretty sure. But out of that, when, I'm, when you watch a show like that, when you go to sleep, what are you in? You're in like... You're in the movie itself. You're the CIA agent. You're, the, you're on Dutton Ranch. You're on whatever show you've watched for like the last eight hours. You have meditated on it. You've filled your mind with it. It starts to overflow. When I got hooked on jujitsu, this was about 10 years ago now, every conversation turned into a story about jujitsu. I mean, Amy would be talking about pork chops, and I'd make it about jujitsu. She was so tired of hearing about it because I was, I was consumed by it. When we begin to meditate on God's Word, it begins to overflow. And it doesn't mean we turn every conversation about Jesus, but it should be filtered in there. It should be sprinkled in. It should be a natural. The reason we have a hard time with sharing our faith is because it feels forced. I have to do this. But when you begin to see the life-giving answers that God has given us, and you see the grace of what God has done for us, it begins to overflow in conversations. I'm amazed at how many times I've seen God at work through something I read on a Tuesday, and then Thursday I have a conversation with somebody, and it was just the right verse to share. Not pushing it, just a conversation. But you start with the filling of your mind. He says, you want to do this right, I need you to meditate both day and night, and you will have good success. And finally, verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Third time, do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I love that passage, because there's promises uh, not just for Joshua, but for all time, when you realize God keeps his promises, and he says, uh, I will be their God, and you will be my people. Will we draw close to him? Will we seek after him as a result of this? And so out of this, Joshua has to make a decision. You know, he's following up Moses, and he goes and tells the people, hey, we're going to take the promised land. We're going in in three days. And they respond well. Verse 16, I want, if you have it in your Bibles, I invite you, there might be something you want to underline in a second because something stands out. Verse 16, he says it this way, And they answered Joshua, All that you have commanded us, we will do. Wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Underline that if you're the type to underline it. Because they didn't follow Moses, and they sure didn't follow Joshua, okay? There's people like Achan, whose own sin cost thousands of people's lives. This is what happens, but they said, only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. So they had good intentions to start this off, but they're going to come up short. But Joshua, Joshua kept to it. Joshua kept his word. He followed God. He served God. And so when you get to the end of his life, he gives a challenge right before he dies. 
he gives a challenge to the people now. They've gone into the promised land. They've not fully secured every part of the promised land. They've compromised, and we'll look at that in this. But the legacy that he leaves behind, finding in verse 14 of uh, chapter 24, this is the end of the book, it says, Now therefore the, fear the Lord. This is his challenge to the people. Fear the Lord and serve him with sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. He says in verse 15, If it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He said, you need to choose who you're going to serve today. And I would call that to each of us. We have to choose who we're going to serve today. It is a choice. Um, are we going to accept what God is doing in our life and respond and, and, and surrender like surrendering to the ministry, for instance, or are we going to try to do it in our own power? You know, Moses doesn't go into the promised land because he took matters into his own hands. There was a time where he chose to disobey God. He took matters into his own hands and his own strength, and because of that, it cost him the promised land. Which side do we want to be on? Because Joshua, we see that. Verse 29, at the end of the book, look at how he's described. And these things, after these things, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. Remember, he started off as Moses' assistant. What's he called here? The son of Nun, the servant of the Lord. He served God faithfully. Will we serve him? When he's calling us into these areas, will we, will we invest in others through that? You know, when I think about this, you know, I'm praying for you for strength and courage. For those that are feeling anxiety or the unknowns that are coming ahead, you cannot gain strength without resistance. And you can't have courage without adversity. So instead of avoiding it, we find out courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is acting in spite of the fear. And some of us, it's kind of fearful. What if, what if I get rejected? You know, what, what if things go wrong? It's not about success or failure in that sense. That's not how success is defined by God. It's like, do you seek him? He says he will guide you and he'll be with you. And that's the promise that goes above everything else. Um, you know, I had that conversation in my head with God. 24 years ago, I was telling him, too young, ill-equipped. I am totally inadequate. And I remember the conversation in my head. I didn't say it out loud, but I said it in my head. And even if I did surrender to the ministry, who would even know to call me? And the phone rang. True story. <laughs> and I picked it up. Kids, this was back when you had a phone in the house. It was not connected to a cord. It was at least wireless. We were that far ahead in technology. But you could only use it in the house and only about 20 feet from there, okay? I picked it up and I said, hello. And he says, this guy says, can I speak to Jason Davis? I said, this is he. He said, Jason, you don't know me and I don't know you. But I got your name from a friend of a friend. And I'm over here at Cairo Baptist Church. And I was just wondering if you could come and speak at our brotherhood breakfast this Sunday morning. This is a Thursday night. And I said, I'll do it. I'll never forget what he said. He was just, he had, he just went in. I know it's late notes, but what, you will? He was shocked. I'm pretty sure I was not his first call. I'm pretty sure I was not his second call or third call. He'd been calling people all day, but in God's perfect timing, as I'm having a conversation with God, he calls me. And I showed up that Sunday, and I shared with them what God was doing in my life. I shared with them encouragement from the Word of God, and then... Uh, we had a lot of bacon, a good old time, and then I went back to Ek Crew, my home church, and I surrendered to the ministry that Sunday morning. And I can tell you, when I begin to look at what God does, the problem is you think about what happened, and I'll close with this. You think about what happened to make Joshua and Caleb the only two that go into the promised land. God, when they sent those spies in, there were 12 of them. They go into the promised land, they spy out the land, these chiefs of their tribes, and they come back and they say, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Honey literally meant honey from bees. Milk didn't mean there were cows everywhere. It meant the milk of the grape. That's why they came back with these huge poles holding down just huge grapevines to show this land is fertile. It's ready. And Caleb and Joshua said, God said, it's our land. Let's go take it. But the other 10 said, there's people there. There's the Amorites, the Hittites, the Philistines. There's giants in the land. And they followed the will of the ten because they were afraid. It was because of lack of faith they suffered in the wilderness. But not Joseph, not Joshua, not Caleb. But here's the thing. You want to know the difference is? The ten saw how big the problem was. Joshua and Caleb saw how big their God is. And if you're facing adversity today and all you can focus on is how big the problem is, 
how inadequate you are, you're missing out on how big God is. If he calls you, have I not commanded you, he says, be strong and courageous. I love that when he tells the people to go into the land, Caleb stands up and he says, I'm 85 years old. I'm just as strong as the day I went in to spy the land. And I'm going to take this mountain right here that's filled with giants. And he did. That's why I like Caleb. Because you know what? You know, sometimes we say you're never too young to be used by God, but also you're never too old. God is not done with you yet. Only be strong and courageous. So in a moment, I'm going to pray and we're going to continue to worship. I just want to invite you. Maybe uh, for you, a next step would be uh, signing up for this Bible reading plan. Uh, I'll mention it during the announcement time. If you're not getting into God's Word, you can simply download the YouVersion app on your, on your phones, and you can actually pick all kinds of topics. If you want to do it with us, we've been going through. Uh, we, we did an Advent devotional in December. We kicked off 2024 with one. That, and my goal with this one is I'm not writing a lot of extra in the devotion. There's about five questions that we ask. you can ask any passage in the Bible. So you don't need me to write it in the long run. You can ask those questions and see what God has to say. Um, maybe that's your next step. Maybe for some of you, it's getting connected through things like Sunday school. Um, I'm going to mention the men's group in a little bit. We're kicking off our men's group this Wednesday night, and I'm going to make it available next Sunday night. We're kicking off two different groups, so if you can't make Wednesdays, we'll make it on Sundays, okay? But I cannot tell you, I believe we'll look back 10 years from now, men, and we'll say this started a movement. And it changed my family. It changed my life. It changed my kids. It changed my grandkids. I truly believe it. I have seen it happen over the last 20 years. This material that we're going through, the man who wrote it, we have seen a generation of faithfulness and following generations. So maybe you're here and, and you need to sign up for that. You can mark it on your card, men's group. And I'll follow through this week. I'm going to start getting with everybody to see what time you can make it. And we'll, we'll have a big group or a large group or a small group. It's okay. But I don't want you to miss that opportunity, man. But for some, it's like, I don't know if I want to get into a small group with another man. Be strong and courageous. Don't let the fears keep you. I'm not here to call men out, but I will call you up. Because that's what speaks to us as men. Maybe you're here and you've never made that decision to follow Christ. Moses took people out of physical slavery. Joshua brought them into physical rest. Jesus died on the cross for your sin, so you don't have to be a slave to that sin in your life. He died on the cross because we can't save ourselves. And if you're here and you've never made that decision to follow Christ in a moment, I'm going to pray and stand up here at the front. And I want to invite you to come to the front and say, I want to follow Christ. Or I want to become a Christian. I'll know what you mean and we'll start there on this journey. But don't miss the opportunity to find that God is our salvation. And truly understand who Jesus is in our life. So let me pray for us and we'll continue to worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this book. I thank you for the faithfulness of Joshua and your people and how you work through them. Lord, I pray that you work through us in a way that you get glory, you get honor. I pray for those that are struggling with big problems ahead, questions they don't have answers to. Lord, I pray that you'd be the God of all peace. Lord, your word tells us in James, if we lack wisdom, you give generously without finding fault. So I pray for wisdom in this room, how to be the man you've called us to be, how to be the woman you've called us to be to be your follower. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to respond. Anything I said that was distracting, Lord, I pray it'd wash past our ears. But Lord, I pray that your truth would sing deeply into our hearts right now. It would change us and we would be able to give you glory and honor as a result. We ask all of this in the only name we know how, the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Would you come? Would you respond as God would have you this morning?
Thank you for being here today. It is an honor to worship with you. Uh, God has been at work in this room, and we're excited to get to celebrate in that. Um, before we do, we've got a couple of announcements just to, to get everybody on the same page. First of all, that men's group that I mentioned, uh, we're kicking it off this Wednesday night right after prayer meeting. So around 7.35 to 7.45, I'm just going to do a kickoff. There's a video I'd like to share of the guy that founded this. Uh, I've met him personally. I've seen 30 years of faithfulness in this guy's life. And so he just kind of shares the why behind the study we're going to do. Uh, we're also going to do it on next Sunday night. I don't have a time yet because I need to know what guys want to do what. But some of you mentioned Sunday night last week. Some of you mentioned Wednesday. If you are interested, um, so I can kind of make some plans. If you just mark on your card, uh, men's and Sunday or men's Wednesday, if you haven't already done that, I've got the ones from last week already. And I'll be following up with that this week. But um, that would be a, a great next step. Uh, and getting connected through that. Also, if you're interested in that 2024 Bible plan, there's still, I believe, like 17 days left or something like that that's still in it uh, to kick off this year. You can text the number 2024, just that, nothing else, to 662-300-3783. It's the same number for everything we send here. But if you do that, it'll ask you to sign up, and you'll start getting those uh, devotions starting tomorrow by email. And so it'll ask you. You can't just send it, and it just happens. you got to fill out that form to, to get your email uh, on there so that we can send that out. But I'm excited to see what God's doing through that. Uh, you'll get a text this afternoon inviting you to share kind of what God's been doing in your life already this last, uh, last week as well. And so uh, some other things that we've got going on, uh, there, is, uh, there are snowmen that have appeared in the foyer. Uh, the Operation Christmas Child team uh, has made these little snowmen out of the little bottles, and they're just asking people to take one of these Fill it with quarters and put it back in the donation box. I'll tell you, um, uh, there's some bigger bottles too, okay? So if you've got lots of change, you might want to grab the bigger bottle. But this bottle here is just about the right amount of quarters to send one box in Operation Christmas Child to kids around the world. And we'll talk more about what is Operation Christmas Child if you don't know what that is. We give Christmas boxes to kids around the world that also share about the love of Jesus. Also, their next craft party, kicking off this year's craft party, is this Thursday at 6 o'clock at the fellowship hall. So if you're interested, please come join us. It's great with the kids uh, to help with that. That's what our kids enjoy doing with that. A um, couple other things. There's a baby shower for a girl for Meredith and Hunter Treadaway, and that's January 21st from 2 to 3. And so we just want to let you know about that. I can't think of any other announcements that way. I know we have one announcement from Clint.
Uh, thank you, everybody, for your, uh, just a moment of your time. Uh, I know we started off worship uh, this morning with a song called God's Plan. Uh, I thought that was very unique when I heard that because about two years ago, God's plan came and uh, it sent us a worship ministry. And we want to recognize his second year anniversary with us here at Friendship uh, with a card and a small token of our appreciation. Uh, and if you would, please let Nathan know how much we appreciate the work he does. He, he, does, a, he, does, he does a great job leading our worship uh, and preparing our hearts each and every Sunday. And we appreciate it very much. Thank you, Nathan. We have one last announcement to give, and I would like to invite... Uh, we have Alex Westmoreland uh, that's coming forward. I'm going to be down here at the front with her. Uh, she came forward and she said she was ready to give her life to Jesus. And she did business with God today. So if you're excited about that, would you let her know? So this is the beginning of the journey as we walk alongside her and the family. And so we're just so grateful to get to be a part of this. And so um, I'm going to close this out in prayer in a second. If you'd like, uh, you can come this way and... Uh, do you shake hands and hug, or what do you want to do? High five, whatever yeah, you're comfortable with. All right, you're, so uh, come join her and let her know how happy you are, because we, we went through this too, okay? So we know what it's like, and we're so excited for the journey you started. So uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, let me pray for us, and I hope to see you next week. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what you're doing in the life of our church. For each person here, I pray your blessings on them as they go from this place. We thank you for Alex, especially. I pray that you give us wisdom for her family and for this church just to walk alongside her to help her to grow into your image lord we just thank you for what you're going to do and i pray that you would do kingdom shaking things through her life and that you would get glory and honor through that we ask it in the strong name of jesus amen thank you god bless you all have a great week